All right, Patrick Finkston from the Illinois, joined by State Senator Robert Peters, a Democrat from Chicago, one of the very active, uh, outspoken members on the criminal reform law that was uh, enacted and it will kick in uh, in its entirety, uh, a lot of it in its entirety, some of the big stuff on January 1st. Senator, we had a story uh, for subscribers on Wednesday uh, where some state's attorneys, Republican and Democrat, uh, upstate and downstate, DuPage County, Champaign County, uh, say that they still have some concerns, uh, that, that there are a lot of questions as to specifics on this. Let me ask you on a wide level first, wide angle lens. Did you guys get this bill right? Yes, this bill is, is very much right. Um, what we've done is moved away from, uh, particularly in the cash bill side, we moved away from a system based off of wealth and money uh, to a system based off of safety and threat. Uh, it's why it has the support of so many victims' rights organizations, particularly in domestic violence and sexual assault. It's why the Illinois Coalition Against Domestic Violence said that this is criminal justice reform that puts survivor safety first. Um, as someone who works and lives in an area uh, of the state where I have to interact with violence on a regular basis and have to deal with the trauma and pain that survivors go through, uh, I think first and foremost, changing our system away from how much money you have in your wallet or how much money you have in your bank account to whether you're a threat to another person uh, is an important and vital reform when it comes to reimagining public safety in our state. Oh, you, you're muted a little bit here. I swear I do that every time. Um, we, we, between the Pretrial Fairness Act uh, and, and some of the other activities, whether it was through COVID, et cetera, uh, in, in DuPage County, you know, obviously our second largest county, uh, the state's attorney said they have maybe a handful of people that are that are currently in on low level offenses, if you want to call it that. And, and even even in those cases, the thirty dollar a day credit kicks in by statute. So they're they're out in a week or two anyway. Is is the holding people who can't pay argument? Uh, really valid when when we've seen that recognizance bonds have gone you know way up low you know bond numbers have gone down through the pretrial fairness act have have is is that argument still worthwhile here yeah i mean you know i talk to people who even though they've had very low bonds uh, and they weren't a threat to other people it became extremely disruptive in their lives so let's talk about this in terms of public safety if someone is held for two, three days, not even just the week that you mentioned, but just for a few days, they risk losing their job, risk losing their homes, risk interacting with other symptoms that are, I mean, other systems that are disruptive to their life. So what we say is actually narrow this focus, actually focus on people who are a threat to other people and allow other people to go on and continue their lives because most, about 90 plus percent of them are going to come back and make sure that they appear in front of court. And I think so narrowing it down to public safety and not money is so vitally important so it doesn't even cause other disruptions or other interactions with other uh, systems. You know, there's a story um, about a, a couple of people, I think the coalition has pointed out with people who were working class, uh, right? This is a working class issue first and foremost that struggle to be able to keep their kids because of pretrial detention, even though they weren't a threat to other people. We should not be having that happen. I'm not going to say that 100% of the time that the system's going to work, the status quo, nor the new one, but as much as possible, making sure that we don't have people who risk losing their kids, losing their home, and losing their job so that we can create stability for them individually, create stability for their family, create stability for the community, and at the end of the day, focus and narrow in on the public safety side of things. One of the things that both of these prosecutors argue is that judges need more discretion to be able to say, yes, you're a threat or no, you're not a threat that, that maybe isn't outlined directly in this law. Is that something you all are willing to, to engage in or, or add or change as we move on? Well, so the things that we're doing right now is having implementation processes led by the courts. So what we're trying to do is to make sure that we get feedback, right? A lot of laws, they generally try to have an immediate effective date. We said, no, we're going to delay this, 
give it two years, have an implementation process, have task forces, have conversations with different stakeholders about what we need to get done. So we are making sure when it comes to implementation that we're taking feedback from a variety of different stakeholders, from a variety of different angles when it comes to what's going to happen in terms of the pretrial system. So again, this is not something that was immediately put into effect. It was something that won't go into effect until January 1st. What has happened, what has been very difficult is that after we passed the bill, we immediately started to engage with bad faith arguments and statements about what was happening with the Pretrial Fairness Act. People were talking about it as if it immediately had gone into effect. People were talking about things that were happening in Illinois that were really an indictment on the status quo and not an indictment on a bill that had never gone, had not gone into effect. We have decided to have an intentional process with an implementation uh, plan that's ran by the courts, that's involving different stakeholders so that we can make sure that we get this right on January 1st. And let me make this very clear. We are always trying to make sure that when it comes to implementing this new system, the system moving away from wealth to safety, that we do this right. So we were always going to engage and talk about what can we do to make things better. So those are going to be ongoing up until January 1st. And those are things that definitely will be happening post January 1st, because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we have a safe, secure system that we're doing whatever we can to make sure that's right. And we're making sure that most people who are interacting with this system, particularly the people who are most impacted by this system are getting the justice they deserve. Let's let's be frank, you know, just just between between us and whoever sees this, you've said some some pretty critical things about policing and police in general um, is and there have been a lot of complaints about this this law that it is, quote unquote, anti police uh, is is that, you know, are you in that camp? Are you anti police? The 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 people who who, you know, the ACAB kind of people that 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 just are against police and does this bill do the sort of things that that some people are are saying it does no i mean I, honestly what i think is that we have created a system that puts too much on police due to the defunding of a variety of different social services the closure of schools the closures of mental health clinics we're asking police to do way too much I actually want to make sure that people who are working in law enforcement have the space and capacity to focus on someone's threat. So when we think about things like gun violence or murder or domestic violence, that we're focusing as much on that as possible and not on the petty things. So in fact, when I think about public safety, I think that we've actually put too much of our broader safety, like safety net, onto police departments. And actually, what we need to do is make sure that when it comes to mental health, that that's funded, when it comes to housing, that's funded, when it comes to education, that's funded, and to make sure that when it comes to policing, that if someone is getting shot or someone's experience of vehicular hijacking or someone's experiencing domestic violence in their home, that that is actually something that we can focus on and make sure that we, A, are able to solve it, and B, that we're doing whatever we can on the front end systemically to prevent it. So no, this is, and when we think about the Pretrial Fairness Act, it actually expands some of what police can do in an effort to reduce the burden on uh, the court system. So if someone, it's, a, it's very low level, you want to be able to cite them and tell them when they need to come to court, an officer now has the ability to do that instead of having to drag them directly into the court system itself. It can reduce the burden to focus specifically on threats and on violence. So in fact, when we think about what this bill means is that it's actually about focusing on public safety as much as possible, particularly the threat to a person. We want to make sure that if you are, especially like say domestic violence and someone's in your home and you've been experiencing that pain, and that trauma, and you've called to accuse that person, that they're not left in the home, that they're taken, they're taken into, and they have to show that they're not going to be a threat to uh, you know, their partner or their children and that we can actually narrow and reduce the burdens on things that don't necessarily matter, something petty, and focus on things that truly do painfully matter to people, which is violence. Before we let you go, Senator, and I appreciate the time, um, you and I are, are, are from very different backgrounds, of course. I'm a, I'm a hayseed farm boy from downstate who, who grew up with, with shotguns in, in the closet when you walk in the door. Uh, obviously, you know, Southside is a, a different situation anywhere in the 
the, the city at this point is is a different situation in crime. You know, I, I know that I know that guns are a problem, especially ghost guns, illegal guns, people using guns illegally. But it, it also seems as if some of those crimes aren't being prosecuted to their fullest. Do do prosecutors, whether it's whether it's Kim Fox in, in Cook County or or Julia Reitz in Champaign County, do they need to be doing more to prosecute people who are on a path to higher level, more violent crimes, even if even if they're, you know, juveniles or youth that are that are carrying a gun and or or shooting at someone or something like that? Are we are we not getting enough done early on to stop some of this this increase as time goes on? I actually think that we spend way too much time on individual gun behavior. Um, so I hear you when it comes to having a gun in your home. We, when it comes to the gun owner uh, and the individual that is there, we spend so much time on that. And I am someone who has, you know, obviously deep skepticism when it comes to guns uh, and the proliferation of guns. But I think that our focus really needs to be on the people who profit. Um, there are people who are making millions of dollars anytime there's a mass shooting. Uh, there are people who are manufacturing weapons hand over fist uh, with no intention of keeping people safe. I actually would say that we put too much on the prosecutor and too much on the police uh, when it comes to guns. And we need to start actually putting our attention on the people who are manufacturing these weapons and those who profit from it. So I want to make sure that, yes, we ban assault weapons uh, and we have that. That is something where I'm sure we have some differences. But I also want to say, like, long term, we really need to go after uh, the Wall Streetification of gun violence. And so uh, that's sort of where my energy is at, is if you're an investor and anytime there's a mass shooting that you see your stock price go up, then I don't want to hear you talk about any violence that happens in the state of Illinois I want you to reassess why you're making money hand over fist after every mass shooting. And I've said before, I'm one of the few pro gun and pro gun control people all at the same time. So uh, it's it's I, I'm I'm in a gray area when you get there. Maybe we can talk about guns some other time. But uh, Senator Robert Peters, thanks so much for the time. Definitely, thank you.